Greetings. Welcome to In Conversation with Seva, brought to you by Heart and Soul Broadcasting Services. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today I'm in conversation with Hopwell Chinono, award-winning journalist and documentary filmmaker. If you enjoy this conversation, please subscribe, like, and share. Enjoy this thought-provoking conversation. <music> Hopeful she know no. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Second time around. And what I like about this, this is face-to-face, -face, not Zoom, like we did during COVID time. That's true. That's very true. At Purple, last time you were here, um, you had not been arrested. And then you got arrested. And a lot of people, uh, there was a sense out there that this show had contributed to your arrest. Do you want to clear the air? that I didn't cause you, I wasn't part of you getting arrested? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. I, I don't think uh, you had any contribution to my arrest. My arrest was premeditated by the um, by the state and by ZANU-PF. Um, the, the warning shot came when Patrick Shinamasa, who was then the acting spokesperson for ZANU-PF, had a press conference where he was uh, asked by Blessed Nklang about my case. And um, he s mentioned me by name and warned me and said I should stop what I'm doing. Uh, I'm going to get into uh, hot soup if I continue doing what I'm doing. So they had already planned that. Uh, I think I think your show only helped people to understand uh, the substance of the reporting that I was doing on the looting of public funds related to COVID-19. Mm. And then when, when we were, when we had that conversation, I asked you, were you scared, were you frightened that you might be arrested? And you made a very powerful uh, st statement that you're not arrested. I just want us to play the video so that people get a sense of what it is that you, that you said. Are you, are you, uh, do you feel safe? You, we've had uh, um, Patrick Chinamasa calling a, a press conference and saying, and kind words about you. We've had uh, the Zanu PF uh, youths uh, doing the same thing. Do you feel safe? You know, Trevor, I've reached a point where I say to myself, when I'm scared, terrified, or living in fear, it makes no difference. Uh, because if someone wants to get to me, uh, whether I'm bold or whether I'm scared, they'll still get to me. So I've decided to say, I'll just soldier on. Nobody's safe at the moment if you criticize the government. So that's why you said you were not you were not scared. Interestingly, as I was watching that video again, I remembered how scared I was when I got arrested uh, the first time. Uh, I'd gone to Namibia uh, for um, uh, for a media conference, and I came back and I got home and I told that they were looking for me. I ran away, uh, and uh, eventually they caught up with me. Now that you've been in prison, what do you, do you, are you scared of being arrested or if you've been immunized? No, I'm not scared of being arrested at all. Um, as I mentioned last time, uh, you know, my reporting as a journalist is uh, part of my work and it's uh, protected by the constitution. Uh, the people who carry the burden um, of arresting me and jailing me is the state and the ruling party ZANU PF, which has captured state institutions and uses them to punish journalists who are exposing corruption or who are covering things that they don't want covered. It's happened again to Blessed Mklanga and uh, uh, his colleague. Um, when I was first arrested, I, I knew that they were coming because not everyone in the system agrees with what's happening. The system uh, is not homogeneous, and I always tell people that don't insult everybody because not everyone agrees with what's happening. So a day before, I was warned that they were coming. Um, I was actually not staying at home. Um, I was I was staying at the village. So when I was told that they were coming, I made sure that I was home so that when they came, uh, they would they would get me there. 
the idea being that uh, when you run away, it seems like uh, you've committed a crime. Um, but I understand why you ran away because there's also the fear factor. But in my case, I just thought, you know what, this thing must come to a head. Uh, let them do what they want to do um, because they will do it anyway. Even if I run away, they'll yeah. catch up with me. And um, <clears throat> I think the biggest problem, <clears throat> of course, for everyone around me was the fear factor. People were worried. Um, my sisters were saying, you know, don't say these things. Look what has happened now. Um, the family does <clears throat> pressure, isn't it? The extended family and friends. Indeed, the extended family feels the pressure and sometimes you feel very sorry for them because it's like you're watching a movie. Uh, these people are, are, are in panic mode and you're not um, because you know exactly how the movie is going to play out. You know that you're going to go to court, magistrate's court, you're going to be denied bail. You know that you're going to go to the high court. Uh, you know that if you're going to get bail, it can only be in the high court. You know that if there is an instruction, even at the high court, you're not going to uh, you're not going to get bail. Uh, like in the case of Job Scala, which is absolutely ridiculous and is calling it's terrible. Yes, where they are, they are, they are. There's a brazen. Um, uh, I mean, they don't care about what the world thinks. Uh, the Constitution clearly said that bail is a is a right. Um, and, and they've been denied bail. Job Scala, Godfrey Stolle, and the other 15 Yatsime uh, supporters of Triple C, they've been denied bail. And um, what is the point? What do you think the government's trying to achieve? Because from what you're saying, they don't care about what the world thinks. Are they clearly damaging brand Zimbabwe? They're damaging the name of this country. Um, forget about Zanu PF. I don't think they care anymore about the damage that they're inflicting on the uh, name Zimbabwe, brand Zimbabwe. Uh, I don't care. I don't think. I don't think they care anymore about what the world thinks of them because if they did, some of the things that they're doing are absolutely ridiculous. Uh, even Mugabe didn't do some of the things, and Mugabe is the standard for bad governance everywhere in the world. Uh, you mention Mugabe, the first thing that comes to mind is bad government governance. And the fact that when they came into power through the military coup, we thought that they were going to be different. They were, and they had an opportunity to do things differently. Now, my, my theory is that they are naturally incompetent um, because they could be making more money than they're making today if they were doing things the right way. They would not be, uh, they, they, they would not be inflicting uh, damage to brand Zimbabwe and even brands and PF and themselves in their individual capacities if they were doing the right thing. So I don't think there's a normal human being who would want to inflict pain on themselves if they know any other way. So I think uh, uh, the, 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 the whole thing is uh, angered by incompetence. Um, corruption is there, looting of public funds is, is there, the plundering of the natural resources are, is there, but I think there are many states that we can uh, look at where all those things happen, but because there's a, an element of competence in, in how the government is being run, things are not as bad as they are in Zimbabwe. I mean, we don't have water in our homes. We don't have medication in hospitals. No electricity, no, no roads. The list is long. So I, I, I shared with you, you know, that um, when they were looking for me, I, I, was, I was afraid. When finally they got me, um, initially it was, I didn't know what was going to happen to me in prison and so forth and detention. Went inside. Um, when I came out, I was a changed person. I was no longer scared. They'd, they'd hit their best shot. And there was nothing, what else could they do to me? Um, so, so being in police detention actually changed me. It made me stronger. It made me actually realize that, oh, maybe, maybe I'm fighting for a, for a good cause if I wasn't convinced now this is the right time, this is the time. I mean, we talk about two decades ago, if not more, I mean, mm. 30 years ago. Did prison change you? Did, you? did it change you? And if it did, how did it change you? Prison definitely changed me. Um, the first time when I was arrested on the 20th of July, uh, every process and procedure was new to me. 
I'd never been in police detention. I'd never been arrested my whole life. Uh, I'd never been in a court of law. I, I, I've never committed a crime which uh, required me to go and be tried. Um, I'd never been to prison. Um, so each step, uh, there was an element um, of anxiety because you don't know what the next step is. <clears throat> But the second time when I was arrested, after I exposed that Henrietta Rishwaya was going to get bail and opposed, and the third time when they arrested me um, in January 2021 for something that I'd not done using a law that did not exist, I, I, I was not bothered at all. Okay. Yeah, I was not bothered at all. I, and I was not bothered because I now understood uh, that within the police service and within the prison service, uh, there are very good people in there. Um, and 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 it became much easier to uh, understand that the fight against corruption, the fight against the looting of public funds, it's a fight that is not only benefiting those of us that are perceived to be middle class, mm -hmm. but it's actually helping uh, even civil servants, prison officers, because these prison officers and police officers would tell you their stories. Mm -hmm. They would tell you their suffering. Um, and 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 um, they would, uh, in, in so many cases, tell you about what's happening in their families. I mean, when I was at Chikurubi prison, uh, we were, of course, not eating uh, the food there. One, because uh, for security reasons. Yes. And second, because it was just badly cooked. Um, terrible, they, food. terrible food. They boil beans with water and they cook uh, sadza and they give them that sadza with uh, boiled beans and the the gravy or soup is the water uh, and they just add salt. But the prison officers were eating that food and some of them, if not most of them, they take uh, the beans back home and they would explain to me that I'm taking these boiled beans home so that uh, my wife can then cook it and spice it properly and then that's our dinner. So I realized that uh, these people that are looking after us are actually suffering as well and they understood our fight, that our fight is not about removing a government. Uh, our fight is about um, a fair society. Our fight is about asking a government not to steal public funds that are meant to protect the vulnerable in our society. You say it changed you. In what way? It changed me. I, I, I don't... I'm not scared anymore. As I said, the first time I was prepared, but there was an element of fear. But this time around, the second time, the third time, I was not, I was not bothered. Even I've just come back from from Europe where I was away for, for almost three months. And I was getting phone calls from people in the system to say, why don't you just stay there? You know, save yourself all this trouble. And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not bothered. I've not committed any crime. Yeah. So if I've committed a crime and if they can prove uh, that I've committed a crime, then fair and fine, but I've not committed a crime. All these cases, the three cases, two of them have been thrown out by the High Court. I mean, the first one, the judge said that there's actually nothing before the court, and yet I spent 45 days in, in, in prison. And then they took the title disc to my house, which they still have. They took my passport. I paid uh, $20,000 uh, as a uh, bill reconnaissance. And for, for something which a judge says is not even before me, he said, I would like to acquit this man, but I can't even acquit him because there's nothing before the court. Uh, you acquit where something has been put before the court, but as it is looking at these papers, there is nothing. And then the third case, the judge said, there is no such law under our statutes that law does not exist that you are saying you've used to charge this man. Uh, and, and, and the state didn't even bother to turn up for the hearing because they understood that they were persecuting me. I'm confused because I don't know when, when, I, see, when I see you going to court and so forth, I'm like, is this still going to court? What's happening? So which, court, which case is now still alive? So I was arrested on the 3rd of November 2020. Uh, after I had practiced as a journalist, um, I, I published that um, Henrietta Rishwaya 
uh, who's, who's uh, 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 related to powerful uh, people in government, had been uh, given bail unopposed after she had been caught smuggling six kilograms of gold out of the country to Dubai. Um, when they came to my home, they said, we are arresting you for violating your bail conditions for the first matter. But when we go to the police station, some of them, they said, you know what? You've not committed any crime. We've just been told to scrap for something. So now we are going to say uh, you, you, you published the issue of Henrietta Rishwaya and that uh, because you published that issue, a, you, it's obstruction to justice. And I said, but I'm a journalist. Um, and I said, what I published about Henrietta Rishwaya is correct. And they said, look, we're taking instructions. Uh, interestingly, the first time when I was arrested, um, I think that's why people made an inference that uh, Hopewell was arrested because he was in conversation with Trevor. It's, 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 I was telling them stories about the things that I've said in the past. And I said to them, even on in conversation with Trevor, I have said these things. Why is it an issue now when I've said these things? And so when one of the investigating officers was cornered by my lawyer, Beatrice Mtetwa, he then repeated what I had said, that he also said these things on Trevor, <laughs> on Trevor's show. <laughs> so the influence that was drawn was that he was arrested because he said, yeah, but, yeah. but in actual fact, this guy was cornered. And because I had told him about the things I had said on the show, he then just used it as a way to answer the question because he had no proper answers to give to Beatrice and Tetra. Tell me, the... Obviously, the, the experience was terrible in prison. What, what stands out for you um, on, on two counts as the most terrible experience that you experienced, one, and two, what gave you hope when you're in prison? I think the most difficult part for me when I was in prison was those around me, the other prisoners, because I was getting food from home um, and these other guys did not get food from home. They were eating the junk food that is being provided by the prison service. And it was very difficult at night because you have breakfast around 7, 8. Then you have lunch around 11. Uh, then you have your supper around 2. But I could not eat around those times because they were ridiculous times to be having supper at two. Um, so I would go upstairs when we are locked up and then I would have my supper, the normal time that I have supper. But it pained me so much uh, that I'm having this good food and all these guys are just looking. So eventually what would do with my co-accused Jacob Ngarivume and eventually with Job Scala when he jo joined us, would uh, take half of our food and then share it with all the prisoners in the, in, in, in the cell. That was very difficult. The second thing that was difficult for me personally was the fact that you are logged in at three and you are released um, at six in the morning. And you are in this prison cell which does not have water. And there's an open toilet in there. Uh, and people have no water. Um, and people are sleeping on the floor. People actually sleep on the floor. Um, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to understand how human beings can treat other human beings like that. Um, the most interesting thing when I was in prison was to notice that uh, there was once uh, facilities like beds that were provided for. You could see the marks of beds on the wall, that there was a bed here 
but the state has failed so much that they can't provide beds. They can't provide water in the cells for these inmates uh, to use the toilet. There's no drinking water, so these inmates have to use jugs um, to get water outside. Sometimes the water is not even there, so they will take water from a disused uh, fish pond, um, and that's what they drink. Are you bitter? I'm, I'm not bitter at all. I'm not bitter at all. I've actually engaged my jailers, the people that I know were responsible for my uh, incarceration. Uh, they've spoken to me, uh, some direct, some indirectly, and um, I've made it absolutely clear to them that for me, it's never about myself. Uh, it's never about removing a government illegally, as they always happen about. It's about a fair society. I live a comfortable life. I can go and get employed anywhere in the world. In fact, I get job offers all the time. People think I'm mad to stay here. Uh, I get I get editors around the world calling me to say, why don't you come and run the Africa desk? I get calls from international uh, organizations asking me to do communications and things like that. And um, But I think that, you know, I, I was given so much by this country as I was growing up. I went to college. I did not pay school fees. Um, it was someone's taxes that were doing that. And I then went to Britain and America to study, came back, had a, a brilliant career. Um, and I think I, I have to give something uh, to this society because if we become selfish and forget about the society that gave us something, that's how societies get uh, uh, broken. And that's how societies are, are destroyed when people think about themselves only. And they don't think about the young boy who is in, uh, in Shabalala, the young boy who is in Murewa or Lutito, the, the young boy in the township, the young girls who are being married off uh, when they are 14 years old. If we don't think about those people and don't use uh, our agents to make sure that we change society, then we, we become selfish. Hope well, you, you've been very outspoken uh, on corruption um, and on just the breakdown of um, public services, roads, infrastructure, and, and, and so forth. Well, as you sit here, what's your sense? Are things getting worse? Are things getting better? Are you being vindicated? Do you feel that you're being outspoken is, 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 is causing some traction of some sort? The tragedy is that I've, I've been vindicated. That's the tragedy. I would have liked the situation where I'm not vindicated. It would have meant that things are getting better. Um, we, we, we live in a country where there's no single radiotherapy cancer machine. I made a speech in Geneva about it um, at the UN. When I came back, I was lambasted by ZANU-PF and some elements in government, and they said I was a sellout. Um, they even lied that these machines are there and they are working, uh, yet people are dying every day. So the whole of Zimbabwe does not have a single working radiotherapy cancer machine, and it costs only $2 million to buy one. I thought somebody said there's one now. We don't have a single no. one at all. The health minister went to parliament and said they are, they, they are working. It's not true. They are not working. There's no single one. Um, Parinyatwa has got three. They are all not working. They haven't been working since last year. Um, Mpilo Hospital in Blawayo has got two. They are not working as well. Um, we live in a country where the biggest hospital, Salim Gabi Hospital, has got only one working maternity theater. Um, in, in total, it has got two maternity theaters. One is not working. Both maternity theaters were built in 1977 by Ian Smith. Um, and ZANU-PF as a government has not built a single maternity theater in 42 years at the biggest hospital in this country. And as a result, 2,500 Zimbabwean women die every year giving birth. Uh, to build a maternity theater, it costs about uh, 37,000 uh, US dollars. And uh, one land cruiser uh, would, would build 11 maternity theaters 
and yet in government there are thousands of land cruisers. To tell me, uh, Popo, you're saying this is incompetence. Is this incompetence or they just don't care? I think... It was incompetence you'd see in effort and uh, buildings would be falling over and that kind of stuff. But but nothing, when nothing is being done, where you seeing the poverty that you and I experience? Um, you know, the thing that breaks my heart every morning as I drive to this place is to see uh, the number of uh, men and women looking for firewood um, uh, and, and the desperate conditions that the majority of our citizens are in. That, to me, that doesn't look sound and look like it's incompetence. It just sounds like they don't care. Yeah, I think, I think they don't care. Uh, that's true. And, but I think they're also incompetent um, because the efforts, um, the comical efforts that you see them investing in point towards incompetence because if they knew how things were done, they would try and do the right thing. Because, for instance, um, <clears throat> the theatres are not working maternity theaters. The biggest hospital has got only one working theater built in 1977. And people are having to give birth in makeshift theaters in Bari. What, does, what, what, what do ZANU-PF political elites do? They go to those makeshift maternity theaters and donate things. That's, that's, that's a level of incompetence. Uh, because if, if, if they were not incompetent or if they had good advisors, they would have said, no, these things that you want to donate to these makeshift uh, theaters, actually let's take them to the main hospital and make things work there so that these uh, uh, makeshift maternity theaters in Bara are not there. But, but for them, that's a solution. Uh, there's a crisis of bread. They will go and build those medieval uh, bakeries and they say that is the solution. That to me is, is a level of co incompetence because uh, this country engages with China and ZANU says uh, their friends, their real friends are, are, are China. Ch in China, you can invest uh, one million in proper ovens, which they can distribute across the country and actually help them win votes. But because they are incompetent, they don't even know about those things. They want to win votes, so I don't think that they don't care to a point where they don't want to win votes. They just don't know. Because doing the right thing means you win votes. But if, if you don't even know what to do in order to win votes, uh, then it, it points towards incompetence. The other thing that you've been very outspoken about, actually I should say that in many cultures, Hopo Chinono sounds, walks like is the opposition, is the leader of the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, your voice reverberates. And one, one thing that uh, it reverberates on is uh, the campaign register to vote. What's your sense of uh, are the young people coming out to vote? Are people responding to the call of it or call to action to register and vote? I think in spaces where people like myself and others have been able to influence, people are coming out to vote. But I think the opposition needs to mount a voter registration campaign. It isn't done that yet. Uh, it's being done ad hoc. But uh, I hope that the main opposition leader, Nelson Shamisa, is going to come out and uh, mount a voter registration campaign because he's the most popular politician in Zimbabwe. And that popularity should be used to harness uh, the, the voter registration campaign to make sure that young people uh, vote. Young people love Nelson Shamisa. And, and um, so it requires him, again, to use that popularity uh, to make sure that they are registered to vote. The, the, the issue of registering to vote is so tragic because, for instance, in 2013, 
uh, only 21 people out of every 100 that were eligible to register to vote and vote or that to do so. Um, which means that uh, 79 people did not bother to go and uh, register to vote out of every uh, 100 or did not bother to go and actually vote out of every 100. Now, what that does, what people don't understand is that ZANU-PF uh, and, and the related institutions that are used to manipulate uh, the voter process and to rig the elections takes advantage of uh, that disconnect. Those 79 people allow ZANU-PF to rig an election because, as they say, you might not vote, but you are going to vote anyway because someone will vote for you. Now, let's assume that uh, 90 people had bothered to register to vote and actually went along to vote in 2013. 90 out of every 100, that's 90%. It meant that ZANU-PF would only have 10% to play around with. And you can't rig an election with 10%. Now, the tragedy that we have is the youth have not been receiving messages of hope, of inspiration. It's okay for me to say that ZANU-PF steals public funds. It's corrupt. All the ills of the ZANU-PF regime, they are well documented and known. But what is important is for me and everyone else who's looking for change to explain to these young people what change will look like. You've got to inspire them. I've written an article, uh, I wrote it in 2019, about Kaniba for young people where I was explaining to them that Kaniba is dead, it's a dead asset at the moment, but we can turn it around by removing taxes, making it a tax-free zone, uh, saying any Zimbabwean and any foreigner who wants to come and invest in Kariba will not pay taxes for a period of five years or 10 years. And that way you create jobs, you make Kariba the nutrition city of uh, the nutrition capital of, of the continent, which means Kapenda, uh, planes are flying out every day with Kapenda uh, to different parts of the, of the continent, trucks are going, to Congo, they are going many parts of the continent. Um, but that requires leadership to sell that vision so that the youth can visualize what the future will look like. I went further and talked about casinos and said that uh, you can turn uh, Kariba into a hub where the rich in Africa can come and, and, and uh, they have casinos at the weekend. Uh, you can also start a boat building business there because you've got the biggest man-made lake in the world. What it does is that when they come, they buy boats. They don't take those boats away. They leave them there. It creates another source of employment for, for locals. You have mechanics who fix those boats. Well, but there's a, there's a disconnect here. I, I hear you saying uh, the young people love Nelson Chamisa. You are saying that young people are not hearing messages of hope. You are saying the opposition is not as, is not out to campaign. What is happening there? What's the problem? I'm 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 not sure. I'm not sure what is happening because uh, just yesterday, I dedicated the whole day to to talk about the track record of. Um, leaders in C who were in the government of national unity in, in between 2009 and 2013. And I talked about what Tendai Biti did. I talked about what Chamisa did as ICT minister. I talked about what Deft Coulter did as education minister. I talked about what Martininga did as minister for constitutional affairs. Uh, I talked about how SIM cards uh, uh, fell from $200 to 50 cents. And you should go and see the retweets there in the thousands. And I was talking about things that inspire young people, messages of hope, to say this is what your future could be like. So why is the main opposition not putting together a message that gives hope 
so that people go out and register. Because the the I understand there are stumbling blocks towards registering. But again, to your point, if ninety percent of the people pitched up when wanting to to register, it would become a huge story. I know we've seen that that happening, but I get the sense that there's something that's not happening to cause the excitement amongst the young people. And hook it up, I've actually had people saying, register to vote, what for? I mean, that's mm. disconcerting in this time and age. It is. Um, and I think as a society, uh, the, 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 the biggest drawback that now affects our society is that we always look for excuses for not doing something. Instead of looking for solutions of fixing a problem. Like that. So when you say ZANU PF is putting stumbling blocks, I say let's not mourn about it. Let's do something about it. Let's go out there and show the world that the stumbling blocks are there. I've always said, yes, the courts are captured, but you cannot make your case to a captured SADAC or captured AU when you don't have the material to say, I went to court on this day, this is what they said. And the same thing applies to Zek. If it makes it difficult for our young people to register to vote, the opposition must, must, must uh, create a file which they can then use. I've spoken, Trevor, to government ministers in South Africa. And when I was in Europe, I was meeting so many political uh, leaders in Europe, in France, in Britain. And when I went to New York, um, you know, I was meeting all these people and they were saying, uh, but what are they doing about this? And this what, is what is the opposition doing about it? About it, yes. And I think, again, um, we've created a culture of toxicity where when someone asks that question, it seems like you are attacking the opposition. When someone asks that question of ZANU PF, it seems you are attacking ZANU PF. Whereas what you're trying to say is, let's fix this problem. Because what's going to happen, Trevor, is a heart attack or, 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 or a heartbreak, either of the two or both, um, in, in 2023. I don't see um, change happening unless we do the things that will make change happen. And one of those key pillars is voter registration. The second thing is the voter's role. In fact, an election is the voter's role in voter registration. Now, if people are not registered um, and, and, and if the voter's role is not cleaned up, then it's the same old stuff of, you know, the election is rigged, we go to court, we get the same result. So let me give you some tragic figures. Between 2018 and um, and today, almost 1.8 million uh, young Zimbabweans turned 18, which means they they were now able to vote. They could not vote in August in July 2018 because they were young. Because they were young, but 1.8 of them can now vote between 2018 and today. Less than 150,000 have registered to vote. Now, um, you've got to subtract the 70,000 from that 150,000, the 70,000 that are dead, that have been cleared of the voters' roll. So in terms of numbers, we are not doing well. People are not registered to vote. And if people do not register to vote, there's not going to be any change that's going to happen in this country. zanu will rig the election, the world will complain about it, and then they will move on. So my call to opposition leaders is that you've got to register your people to vote. You've got to make sure that the voters' roll is cleaned. You've got to make sure that you stop making excuses about why things can be done. You should start creating solutions. The solutions are there. You should implement them. Show leadership. That is what is required. Wow. Now that's a powerful statement coming from Hopeful. Before I, I say before I ask uh, that question, that uh, sometimes I get the sense that you're the leader of the opposition. I must ask you this, this question, Hopeful. Why does it have to take Hopewell to say the things that the people in the opposition should be saying? Why should, does it have to take Hopewell to labor to inspire the young people to vote and not 
the opposition, which is supposed to, I nearly said structures, but I'm not going to go there, which is supposed to have the means to mobilize people to register to vote and inspire them. What's happening in the opposition? I think there's a, there's a sense of, uh, of fear and also incompetence. Um, the fear factor is derived from the fact that people like Hopewell, Job Scala, and Gary Vume, you know, are locked up. <clears throat> and, and some of the opposition leaders, they see Fadzaima are in prison. So they are afraid to say, if we speak out, if we talk about these things, um, we might be locked up as well. And the second aspect is of incompetence. Our politics has never been based on ideas and competence. Uh, we, political parties, when they are formed, they end up aping uh, the, 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 the culture of ZPF. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you look at, 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 at MDC, uh, Shanghai uh, refused to honor a democratic vote, resulting in a split between him and Walshman Nube. Uh, if you look at how people like uh, Elton Mangoma, they were beaten up. People like Trudy Stevenson were beaten up. Uh, that shows a, a society which is aping a ruling party. And if the ruling party can do this, we can do it as well. So change should mean that we do things differently. Uh, and, 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 and so there's, there's that element of incompetence where the brave are the ones that go into politics. Uh, the, those, the men and women of ideas are scared of going into politics. Because if you look at the names that have been called, all based on lies, I've been called a homosexual. I've been called a sellout. I've been called all sorts of names. I've been said I work with ED. I've been said I work with Chiwenga. Uh, and even some people in the opposition, some leaders in the opposition have said, I work with Chuenga. Wow. You know, a man that I only met twice in my whole life. Why, why would the people in the opposition call you those names? Is it because of my own reading that uh, Hopewell is now the leader of the opposition? I think it's based on um, an idea that you are encroaching into our space. Uh, and also, I think it's also based on the close proximity that I have with some of the uh, uh, leadership in the opposition. So some feel threatened that I'm getting close to the leaders and and maybe I'm influencing them and some think that I want positions. And um, to his credit, no such Jamisa has always said to me, I mean, so what if you want positions? Um, so we, we need to change that culture, Trevor, because uh, I have been going around um, different cities and encouraging people of means and people who are educated, who have good skills to consider running for councils. Because councils have collapsed mainly because of ZANU-PF's behavior, but also because of a certain level of incompetence within the, the, the opposition itself. Now, if you send somebody who does not know what a spreadsheet is to council, you don't expect like any we sense. Have now, I mean, the majority of the people we have in council and in parliament don't have the skills that would make them competent if they got into office. Yes. And, and, and uh, I spoke to a, one of the biggest businessmen in Zimbabwe who said to me, I don't even know, I've never met my MP, he's been MP for 15 years, I'm, I'm one of the richest men in this country. I would have expected him to come to me to talk about what they plan to do and the financial hurdles they are facing so that we can assist. So when politics becomes a job, as it has become in Zimbabwe, it is, it is, it is, it, those that want to keep it as a job will push out those that want to bring ideas. At the expense of the country. At the expense of the country, yes. And I hope that <clears throat> this time, since Nelson Chamisa said uh, they are not going to have primary elections, people are going to be chosen by their communities, I hope that that process will bring out good candidates. But there's still a lot of work to, to do. I, I've, I've got liberties to share this because she, she won't mind. Yeah. <clears throat> I've been trying to convince Sisi Dangarembwa 
to go into council. Because I say to a parliament doesn't matter, it? the real deal is in council. Whole thing. Yes. And Sisi said, politics in Zimbabwe is an attractive. You know, first of all, when I said this, they, there was a group of middle class people and intellectuals and business people, and they laughed. They said, ah, you want Sisi to go into council? I said, yes. It's easier for all our libraries to get books from abroad if it is a council in there. She's got something to offer. It's easier for all our um, uh, institutions that require refurbishment to get it if we have got people who have uh, an international outlook. Uh, if, if you, Trevor Ngube, were a councillor for your area in Umskindo, uh, it's easy for you to pick up the phone and speak to Ramaphosa, who you have spoken to, and ask for certain things that do not even require the endorsement of the Zimbabwean government, and you will get them. For me, the, 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 the issue, um, and this is where my good friend Muj Masunde um, always reminds me, the caliber of the people that we elect to parliament and to council should be people that have ideas to empower the citizenry to do their own, their own stuff. It's okay for us to get help from abroad, but we are such a rich country. We could do lots of things for ourselves. Yeah, I, I mentioned abroad because uh, the the... There's a disconnect between central government and local government. Local government is in the hands of the opposition. And unfortunately, central government does anything and everything possible to make sure that central government doesn't work. Let me push you on that. You, you've said we tend to come up with excuses why things don't work. I hear that a lot, that central government wants to make things not happen uh, at local government level. With um, the opposition controlling the majority of the local local authorities, if they were determined to make local authorities work for the benefit of you and I, um, and they went out and they called us out and we they supported us when we did things that are good for us, don't you think that local government would have, would work? I think if we had quality, um, then I go back again. Yes, yeah. the DMS council. If we if we had quality councillors. Uh, we have some quality councillors, but the numbers are not enough to make a difference. Um, and, and so if we had quality councillors, it would be easier uh, to have a, a... Take, for example, Strive Masiwa or Noxon, or, or, or Mr. Nichols, yes. Um, <clears throat> now, if you get someone was your gardener and is now your councillor. What kind of conversation is he going to have? So in, in other countries, in Kenya, for you to be a member of parliament, you must have a degree. You cannot go into parliament without a degree. We don't have that here. We had it in the past where the religion said you must own property. You must have a stake. Now, if you have somebody who's living um, in a cottage and is representing that community, the effects of rents and all those things don't affect him or her, so they don't understand. But, that, but doesn't the problem there, Hopewell, lie on me, the, the elector, the voter? Why am I voting for somebody who doesn't have the, 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 the qualifications? This is, you bring me to a point where I think it's a fundamental point that is being pushed by the opposition, which is so wrong, and that is we need new leaders. No, we need new voters. I think I need new voters who understand that I need to say it when Wopo comes and says, I want to be a candidate, just say, Wopo, let me see your CV so that you represent me. So we need a reformation of us as individuals so that we hold to account the people that represent us. What's your pushback on that? I, I actually, there's no pushback for that one. I think it's, you're correct. And I think that's what Nelson Shabisa is trying to do now by saying that we are not going to have primaries 
the communities must give us candidates. And what he's trying to say, what he's doing uh, by saying that is to say, if Trevor, you give me hopeful, you must make you must understand that you are going to live with hopeful for the next five years. If you give me a bad candidate, it becomes your bad candidate. In the past, political parties would have primary elections and only people within the party would be elected. But this new system that Nelson Chavisa is is put on the table now is to say, you don't even need to belong to the political party for you to be a representative. You are selected or elected by your uh, community first, then you go to become a candidate for Triple C. And so it's important for that. But coming back to the issue you, you have mentioned, um, the, 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 the main question uh, for me is, why are we failing to attract people of great minds? Why are we failing to attract great minds into politics? It's because our politics has been about violence, insults. It, ne- it has never been about ideas. If, you, if, if there are few politicians on both sides of the aisle who come up with ideas, in most of the cases, it's about loyalty. If I say today, Emerson Naga has gotten things wrong, I'll be lampooned on social media by Emerson Nangagwa's supporters. If I say Nelson Chamisa has gotten things wrong, I'll be lampooned by Nelson Chamisa's supporters. And the, the danger of that is you create a, a culture of uh, popular politicians and and who are untouchable. So, for instance, Zanvief has just had a congress and in President Naga was untouchable. But when you look at his track record from 2017 to now, and ask yourself that if our politics was about ideas, substance, and issues, would President Mnangagwa be the candidate for Zano PF today? Uh, would they be putting him forward again for, for, for election? The hospitals don't have medication. The roads are portholed. Homes don't have drinking water. Ninety-five percent of our potential workforce is out of work. So, what would the other issue that you've been outspoken and which is very important is the issue of uh, sanctions. Now, I'll tell you what my take is, and I'm interested in in your push. Yeah. So, I strongly believe sanctions are wrong, but I also believe that the things that we are being asked to remove to 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 get rid of are things that are good for us. So we don't need anybody to tell us that you need to conduct the election, mm. must be free and fair, don't take people's land, don't kill people and so forth. So why not go ahead and do that? So I believe sanctions should go, but we have the responsibility to remove the things that cause sanctions and we're not going, we're not going to lose anything. I also believe that corruption is damaging the economy. But I find that in Zimbabwe, you can't argue that corruption and sanctions are wrong. It's going to be one or the one or one or the other. What's your view on that? Sanctions are wrong. Corruption is wrong. Can't we just agree on that? I, I agree with you, um, and and I've written about it uh, extensively, um, responding to academics who have who have put different views, um, and unfortunately, for a long time, the messaging was was not right. Uh, the, from the opposition in Zimbabwe. But now, Nelson Chamisa has come out and said that sanctions must go. Uh, and 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 I think that there's no sane Zimbabwe who doesn't think like that. S- sanctions must go. Uh, the issue that we always struggle with is that ZANU PF does things that makes makes it difficult for sanctions to go. Sanctions are an external imposition by an external party, the United States of America. We have no control about uh, what they do in their legislation. They determine how they interact with foreign countries. But we have control of whether we're going to have a free and fair election or not. We have control of whether we're going to steal public files or not. 
with control of whether we're going to use violence against each other and kill each other. So the most important message that the opposition must put out there is to say these sanctions are bad for this country and they should go. But the people that are making it are not quibble. Yes, yes. And Northern Jamisa, to his credit, has done that. And and the problem that we have is that ZANPF keeps doing things that makes it difficult for these sanctions to go. So, for instance, the issue of... Uh, let's forget about elections. Uh, the issue of using violence when people don't agree with what you are saying. Um, the, the issue of having job seeker in prison right now, I mean... What's happening? I mean, all those kind of things. I mean, I agree with you. So it's wrong. It's fundamentally wrong. ZPF is deceptive because when President Nangawa, remember, uh, you and I were saying, let's give this guy a chance. Uh, it wasn't only you and I. It was the opposition said so, although some don't want to accept now. But do we just stop there and, and play the video? Uh, of um, uh, Hopewell um, in explaining why, uh, you know, like me, he said, uh, uh, give uh, uh, President Nandagoa a chance. And then after that, just play another video from um, uh, Professor Welshman explaining the position of uh, the opposition uh, during the coup. I was supportive of the change process that we thought was taking place. And it wasn't just, I remember I was getting attacked and you were getting attacked too. But speaking for myself, I was quite aware that the MDC was also in support of that change. I remember the MDC leader calling the change miraculous. Um, and I remember Morgan Changrai saying that it will be remembered as a historic in the same proportion as uh, we remember 1980 when we moved from colonial rule to uh, self-rule. And for me, I looked at the constitution and the constitution stipulated that the next president after the current president resigns comes from the party of the president that has resigned. So there was no ifs and buts about who's going to be the next president. And I remember the MDC as well, endorsing uh, Morgan Changrai, and, and newspapers are there for, to that record. Mm. Um, sorry, I remember, I remember newspapers uh, publishing stories of the MDC endorsing uh, the presidents of Emerson Mnangagwa. So there was no point really for us to fight something that we could not change. And Emerson Mnangagwa had promised that he was going to deliver the change that we were looking for. And looking at the uh, state of affairs in our country, everything was in shambles. So to fight a guy that was saying he was going to change things and we knew we had no other way of removing him, even if we wanted him to be removed, it was pointless. Mm -hmm. So that was the basis in which I said, I'm going to give this guy a chance. On the first day of the processes leading to the coup, we're actually having a meeting of the MTC Alliance at Trang Rai's house. And I was chairing that meeting. And uh, Trang Rai was already unwell. He was in the house, but he was not in the meeting a call came through. Mm. We were about to do a press conference. And obviously these people were connected every eight minutes. Some of the people were with us were in direct comms with uh, those who were carrying out the coup. A call came through. Mm -hmm. uh, Trang Rai's uh, PA uh, said, I, I must come and take that call. The person introduced themselves as a, a Lieutenant General so-and-so and, -so and said, whatever you do, Whatever you do, you do that press conference. If for one second you uh, condemn uh, what we are doing, we will be there. We will be there and you will not like our boots. Right? Uh, so I said, okay. So You've never shared this anyway. No, You're sharing no. this for the first time. I wow. I haven't. A world exclusive for you right there. Please proceed. So, so I put the phone down, mm -hmm. went back and uh, said, guys, uh, this is the call uh, that we just got. Mm? Uh, the rest is history. The rest is history. But uh, I'm sharing mm. this in, in order to say 
if that act, mm. if it was an act of liberating us, it would not have started for me personally with that threat. Mm. The very fact that there was that threat told you that uh, nothing good was going was to come, come out, out of this. Right. Uh, I take no pleasure in, in saying uh, that uh, I knew. Uh, I also secretly hoped that maybe, mm. just maybe, mm. maybe, we might have a break with the past. So I, I broke your, your stride there. So that's the position. And, and you've been very clear. You and I stood up and mm. said, give Nandagwa a chance. And we took a lot of flag for doing that. Yes. Um, and and uh, But we have realized that there's a few things that have not happened right. And they say, no, but let's hold men to account. Yeah, it's actually, it's not a few, it's a lot. A lot has not happened. Uh, the basics have not happened. Um, I think they were very deceptive because I remember when the senators who authored the new Sanchez law came to Zimbabwe, President Nangagwa said, there's nothing wrong with doing uh, what these guys are saying when you were doing something wrong uh, and you now realize that it was wrong. You must not uh, just uh, defend yourself for the sake of it. You must accept. And he said, there's nothing wrong which is being asked us to do or of us to do in the sanctions law uh, all these things are good for our country and that was deception because later on he has not done that so sanctions are bad sanctions should go uh, violence should go rigging of elections should go Corrupt. corruption should stop uh, it might not stop 100% but it must be uh, not done in a way that you leave a central hospital like a rural hospital without paracetamol. Right now, as we are speaking, there's no paracetamol. Parinatwa is not working as we are speaking. It's an emergency mode. So you can't schedule an operation at Parinatwa today. Those are the terrible things. Sanctions will be so insignificant uh, if we were not stealing money because I'll give you a good example. A named cruiser is being landed by this government at 400,000 US dollars. Uh, you ask them why they don't have maternity theaters, why they're not building maternity theaters. They say it is because of sanctions. But one land cruiser can build 11 maternity theaters. Um, you look at uh, the issue of uh, books in schools. Uh, you say to them, why are you not getting books? They say it's sanctions. Uh, Trevor comes with a container full of books. They say, oh, Trevor, which part does he support? He doesn't support that. No, we're not taking those books. So we are sanctioning ourselves. And, and, and so, so sanctions has become a political soul uh, to explain why they have failed. Uh, but we have never had, a, I think, a sincere discussion no. um, a nation. as a nation. Yeah about these things. And I think the day when these sanctions go, when we resolve our issues, we should have a charter as a nation to say, we can't do this because it will attract this kind of behavior. And I think these things must be taught in schools because if you look at the United Kingdom, politics is part of all level and A level studies. So they understand how a, a country is run. We that we do not even we have adults in this country with the university degrees who have will never set their eyes on, on the constitution of this country. The the, the, the one my, my point of Banner's point there is there are segments, I hope well correct me if I'm wrong, in Zanopev who want who are happy with the sanctions there because they benefit from sanctions. Am I right? You are very correct. A lot of the people don't want sanctions to go. That's why you find that when this discussion of sanctions going now and they think they might be removed, they'll go and arrest Job Scala and make sure that he doesn't come out because they know that will be a deterrent for removing those. Uh, they are sanctions. benefiting from this opaque environment yes. that sanctions allows. Exactly, because remember, Trevor, uh, I was young, but you were old enough that uh, down the road from where we are, one of the most senior ministers in this country committed suicide, ashamed of a Toyota Casida. 
look at the corruption that's happening today, you ask yourself, was it worth it for Nyabumbo to kill himself? I mean, if he can see what's happening now, turning his grave and saying to himself, I killed myself for a car. These guys are looting bills. So, so the level of shame has changed also in this country. Uh, and I think the citizen is so desensitized such that even this discussion we are having about sanctions, if you try and have it, people just disconnect. They don't care anymore. They don't care anymore. But again, the opposition needs to go out there, educate people, make one-minute clips. Make them connect with the issue. Yes. So this is my criticism of the opposition, and I've said this to some of them, that they, they tend to be loud when it's issues that affect them, not the populace. Why not come back? Why not talk about the issues that are affecting uh, at the, the, the common common person? You're allowed when you want your packs, when you want your cars, when you are in parliament. Is, is that a fair? Yes, I've had this discussion with Timba, Timba Mlisko. I've said to him, you are so loud about your packs. You want your salaries. You want your cars. That is what place where Zanvevin, the opposition unite. They are agreed when it comes to packs. When it comes to packs. And, uh, and, and, and the tragedy is that um, they are about to dish out 40,000 US dollars per every MP. Uh, and that money... I can tell you that uh, I don't see any of the MPs, maybe one or two, saying they're not taking it because they see it as money that they will use for their campaigns. And ZANU-PF is very clever. It does those sort of things because it knows that the opposition will not walk away from 40,000 US dollars per MP. Uh, that said, the quality, I challenge Zimbabweans to select the right type of candidate because if you get the wrong person into council or into parliament you will have to suffer the consequences we don't have clean drinking water we do not have good roads they are potholed our children don't have books 95 percent of our potential workforce is not working our hospitals do not have medication the whole country does not have a single radiotherapy machine we don't even have a heart bypass machine if you require a bypass, you're going to die. So it's important to choose quality councillors and quality members of parliament. And if we don't do that, Trevor, then we will continue suffering the consequences that we've been suffering in the past 20 or so years. Your friend, uh, Much Masunda, went into council. The change was seen. Yeah. Imagine getting free access to the Newsday, the Standard, the Zimbabwe Independent, and the Weekly Digest for a full month. Well, you can, and all you need to do is download the Newsday e-reader app on Google Play Store or scan the Newsday QR code in any of the AMH print publications and start enjoying the quality content. Wow, that's a powerful message. I, I hope that um, Zimbabweans out there, I mean, it's it's in our interest to be, to be introspect. And I really believe that Zimbabwe needs a new aspect of leaders. It's us who choose the leaders. So let's introspect. Just let's, let's uh, be much more demanding of the people that we elected to uh, into office. I think uh, we've been too serious for a very long time. Yes, we do. But I'll do it. I've got Shaba and Buju. I've got German Shepherds. And, and, and German Shepherds, they're seven months old. Uh, beautiful, very naughty. But they have helped me get in touch with myself some. They've helped me to be very playful like it because it's so playful. They've, they are teaching me to be patient and to tolerate the nonsense that uh, it's a beautiful space to be in, to play with dogs. What is it like with your dog? Uh, I think mine, I was, I, was, um, I was lucky because I guess it was accidental. Uh, what happened is I had parked my car outside the uh, Chisipit shopping center at the Nando's. I was buying some food. Mm. And so I, w I went to back to my car. To, to wait because they said the food will be ready in 15 minutes. 
And then this lady parked, was parked next to me, said, oh, are you hopeful she won't And I said, yes, I'm hopeful she won't uh, Then she said, oh, we were praying for you when you were in prison. So I thanked her and uh, we exchanged phone numbers. Then she phoned me and she said, um, oh, I've got a present for you. Uh, what is your address? So I gave her my address and then she came with this two two dogs so she said choose one um and i said oh it's difficult to choose one and also to have one dog it will be bored and so forth and then she said one dog i'm giving you as a present the other one buy the other dog you buy so i paid 180 dollars for the other dog uh, that's how i ended up with blue and shamba enjoying that i do i do um <clears throat> You know, they take you out of this crazy world that we live in. And um, they, they've made me walk a lot now because they need to walk. So I now go out a lot and uh, I'm not afraid to walk uh, because I'll be hanging with two dangerous dogs <laughs> that, that, uh, that are also friendly. Um, and it's funny, whenever I go abroad, I always pick some treaties for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can make it back at home. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, 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 you, you are one up on me because you are a good cook in the mm -hmm. kitchen. Your mom raised you in an amazing way. The last time we were here, you showed, you shared with us how your mother raised you. Um, what, what does cooking do to you? Uh, for me, it's therapeutic. And uh, I use it to. Again, it was accidental because my mother was a home economics teacher and she used to go into communities and teach uh, <clears throat> rural women how to cook. Um, so she would say to them, you have got um, uh, spinach. Uh, you can cook it in five different ways. Um, don't just cook it the same way every day. Um, so at home, when I was in grade one, I could... I could bake cakes, not because I wanted to, but I had to. Uh, I could do scores and things like that. So it's, it's, it's part of my DNA now. So as I, as I grew older, I was still doing the same thing. I remember that one of my ex-girlfriends could not actually cook. So when she had visitors at her home, I'm the one who would actually do the cooking. But we grew up in a society where... Um, a man who cooks. A man who uh, cooks. To look down. And yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. They think that. Uh, you've I'm been, not degree, so. Yeah, you've been emasculated by your by your wife or your partner, girlfriend. Um, but I find it uh, therapeutic. But I'm I'm very happy because uh, I've seen that on Twitter. A lot of Zimbabwean women, a lot of Zimbabwean men are now cooking. Yeah. Um, and and they 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 go out there. Um. I think uh, King Hussein, he does the cooking, he's got Tim Fudo. Tawan and Yaman yes. cooks, of course, Tito, Tito, um, but when he cooks, yeah. cook, who else cooks? Yes. Um, yeah, so they're quite, a, they're quite a number. I've seen quite a number. Some of them, they use ghost accounts, so <laughs> you don't know the name, yeah. But, but the leader, the leader is, uh, is, um, is Joe Hussein. Yeah. Uh, the king. So he's the chairman of Team Follow, which is a group of people on Twitter who love cooking, and most of them are men. Fantastic. Yeah. Then let me. The, the other issue uh, is um, your guts. Yes. Where are we? I mean, apparently that people can think that it's uh, they are abusing you by 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 the, this amazing enterprise that you're involved in. What's the situation now with the goats? How I many do you have? I know they wanted to take some land, but the goats from you. Yeah. Where are we with that issue? So what happened is that uh, what they first did was uh, the the Zanpi of trolls. They called me Mbuziadula is an insult, and I embraced it. And I did a, a, a three minute video uh, explaining goats, you know, uh, and it became very popular. People were now. Uh, the Buziadula slave backfired because people said, oh, we want to do this goat. And um, then at one point, uh, this year, ZANU-PF thugs led by a guy called Taurai Kundishaya went to my homestead and they lied to my workers that we want to give you more goats and speak on cameras. Um, initially, they wanted to discredit me by lying that I actually got this 
good from government, which I didn't. Luckily, I still had my receipts from 2016, and um, I put out these receipts on social media, um, and it, it was so embarrassing because it became an international story uh, around the world, you know. Um, um, I believe it. Nanga's government wants to grab uh, anti corruption activist uh, goals. Uh, it's a BC, they're reporting about how the Zimbabwean government wants to take goods owned by journalists in Zimbabwe. Yes, and it's so embarrassing. On goal, as they say. Yes. And uh, so now we have got about 110. Some of them are still at the village, but we have moved the bulk of the. Um, the high quality ones, I've, I've, I've taken them to my friend's farm um, for protection because we were not sure what they wanted to do. And, uh, you know, luckily I've got villagers who are not scared, so they stood up to the bullies and they said they can come. We'll face them off. But th these are the things that uh, make it difficult for this country to get investment because if you can do that to, to your own, what will stop you from doing that to a foreigner? Yes. My last question is, uh, no, we need to go to books, isn't it? Um, but I, I must ask you this. The, the trolling, the abuse, uh, the toxicity, uh, doesn't that get to you? In, 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 I think around 2018, uh, it, it, it got to me, uh, but not anymore. Because let me give you a good example straight. I'm accused of having supported Nangabwa for his election. From Jonathan Moyo to all the trolls, I've said, put What's the evidence. The evidence, just one article where I said vote for Nangabwa. They care about evidence, sir. But what? They don't. That's the tragedy. And that's what makes our politics toxic. Uh, I've said, put the, the, the evidence and I'll give $1,000 to a charity of your own choice. They don't do that because they know they are lying. I never supported Mnangagwa's election bid. I only said, allow this guy a chance when they did the coup. Cool. The opposition said the same thing. The, the late leader of the opposition, Morgan Shangri, said that. The current leader, Nelson Chamisa, said that. I have a good relationship with Nelson Chamisa. Uh, and we talk about these things. And so I, I understand what his thinking is, and I understand that some of the people that do those sort of things, um, they see me as a threat because one of that relationship of Nelson Javisa, and two, they think I want to go into politics and I'll end up taking positions. And think. Sometimes you actually see them uh, putting their differences aside with ZANU-PF trolls and ganging up to attack me. And what this does, tragically, is that there is a huge silent majority which watches these things and it becomes disinterested in politics. And the reason why I don't take them on the way I could is because I realize that if I do so, it damages Nelson Chamisa. And sometimes you wonder that maybe these are infiltrators who are sent to do this in the name of the opposition in order to damage it. So what I've done now is to look at the bigger picture, look at the bigger things, and, and leave that. Because I've said to myself, uh, you know, uh, why do you fight strangers? You don't even know this guy. Yeah. And I would rather fight Trevor because I know you. you. It's, it's, yeah, and you and I disagree. Yeah. Peter, we, you know. And our our disagreements is a nation. have never been toxic. Uh, I disagreed with Ngusana Moyo when, when, when um, uh, he, he launched this presidential bid. I said, you're not going to make it. Ngusana Moyo, I can walk into his home now and cook and go and take the most expensive whisk and we'll sit down and drink whisk and I'll tell him that what you're talking is nonsense. And you still come back tomorrow for breakfast? Then he will call me and to find out whether I go home safely. And that's the way it's supposed to be.
a lot of people out there who love uh, books. You brought some books here. Do you want to to to, to talk about them? Yes, yes. Uh, so th- this is an old book I've had, um, but it's it. Uh, and what what book is that? It's called Moral Men in the Moral Society by Reold Nebo. Um, it was in an American theologian, um, and it it. I started reading it again when Alex Magaitha died because it his death really affected me. He was a guy who um you know was trying to do the good things and but surrounded in a in a in a in a in a toxic society um where people insult each other, fight each other. And we had the story with Magaisa. Yes. We we the story with Magaisa that uh, we differed on the coup, and and after the coup he then reached out to me, he called me, and he said, "Look, my brother, we are brothers. You know, uh, we should not allow these things to to get in the way." And we became uh, 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 very close. And when when he died, um, it really affected me because I I I and I knew that it was. It was coming because he was telling me, but he kept it private. So not well. Yes, yes. Okay, and then the this one. So this one is what we owe each other. This is what we are talking about, uh, Trevor. You know, a new social contract. We 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 talk about um, wanting a better society, but we don't want to talk about how we get there, and we don't want to talk about understanding that I owe the next person something. When I use a toilet, I must clean it, so that the next person finds it in the uh, uh, in the same state that I found it in. So this this issue of what we owe each other does not seem to exist in us anymore in this country. So you will find that people go and cut firewood, um, and they don't know what they owe society and their children. That society includes their own children. And, and and so um, I got this book to understand um, issues around economics, how societies live together, and uh, we owe each other a new social contract. Minuch Shafik. Yes, I'll definitely get this. Yes, um, it's a, just it's a powerful thing uh, that the world owes you nothing. Yes, that you owe the world. Yes, that's true. Wonder. That's true. Um, this one's made me laugh. The third word. <laughs> So, so I, I, I have had this book, I, mean, I think for almost 20 years. I first bought this one, and that's the one that first came out. So they were written by Anton Gideon, yeah. who was a professor at London School of Economics. He is seen as the godfather of uh, uh, center-left politics that was espoused by Tony Blair. Blair. Uh, and in America, it was, uh, it was Bill Clinton. And, and, and uh, so I always laugh when I see Zimbabwe is talking about the third way. Um, and, and, and I say to myself, no, the third way is not about forming a third political party. Uh, it's, it's about, um, an ideology, uh, way of thinking. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and how you get there, yeah. how you build society, um, how you build institutions. And so each time when there's this third way debate, uh, or in Zimbabwe on social media, I go back to these books and just to refresh my mind and in order to explain to people what it is. Absolutely. Yes. I've, I've had, like you, I've had these upstairs um, many years or so. Yes. Um, and the tragic way, the tra- new way of thinking, new way of behavior, a new way of building society. Yes. And, and the tragedy is that uh, our people thought that the third way is having a third political party. But those political parties that exist today, like ZANU PF and Triple C, can have a third way. Uh, and 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 change the way uh, they think, change the way society thinks by doing the right things. And the tragedy, Trevor, is that in Africa, there's been an attempt to to have this kind of discourse uh, at a political elite level. But our politics is not angered uh, in ideas. So it's people like Tabumbeki who try and talk about these things, um, and 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 then you have other people coming up uh, and they like 
President Zuma, and you know, there's no difficulty about those sort of ideas. Yes. And then this one? Well, uh, corona, from crisis to opportunity. Wow. Okay. Scott Galloway. Yeah. So this this is an amazing book um, because it talks about the um, I would say it, it says post corona COVID nineteen and it talks about the tragedies that were created, the economic tragedies that were created, and how we can actually exploit them. So we have now learned that we don't have to go to the office. We can work from yeah. home. Uh, that opportunity, people never thought about it. Uh, there are people there who are running multi-million dollar businesses from their bedrooms. Um, we thought that uh, every business must have an office. Um, Trevor must have a building because he, he needs a studio. But uh, if I'm doing things on social media, I don't need to have an office to go and do things on social um, media. But it also looks at the people that have benefited. And the, the ironic uh, thing about it is that uh, the people that had money actually made more money. Yeah. Yes. And in our society in Zimbabwe, again, we recoiled into the same old thing of uh, looking for excuses why we can't do certain things. Um, instead of seeing <clears throat> opportunities. Instead of seeing opportunities. So, for instance, one opportunity that we could have seen in our society is to say, um, you know, we've got educated scientists in this country. Why can't we start making uh, uh, masks? and sending them across the world, making money out of them. Why can't we do that? Um, the reason why we can't do that is that it is opportunistic by those that are linked to the state. Absolutely. So today people are still being forced to, to, buy, to buy masks. masks because so yeah, it's connected is producing, it's producing them. them. Yeah, but it's not being done for the good of society. And if you look at uh, the issue of um, fuel, uh, Fuel in Zimbabwe is more expensive than it is in in Zambia, but Zambian fuel passes through Zimbabwe. <laughs> oh well, it's, thank you so much for sharing those books. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Well, um, you have come under intense pressure for speaking out, but my encouragement, uh, I've been there. I've been like you. I know what it is like to 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 stand out like a sore thumb. People come for you with hammer and dead tongs. Uh, continue speaking up. Never lose your voice. Society, our society in particular, needs great people such as you. And uh, I, I hope you've got political ambitions to <laughs> push the ideas that you're talking about. No, thank you so much for thank you so much for having me. And I think um, my last word is to say that the most important thing about the things that people like myself <clears throat> are doing is that they are now being recognized in countries that are not the usual suspects. Uh, we, we, we've been called Western puppets because we get awards and from Western institutions. But um, when I came out of prison, uh, I got an award for my investigation for um, the looting of public funds for COVID from Nigeria. Um, and, and, and very soon I'll be getting another award um, from one of the countries that you would never even think of. Uh, it means that if you invest your energies in doing good work, uh, people will recognize the good work that you're doing and the impact of that work will be felt many years after you've gone. There's so. a price for speaking out, but it's <laughs> worth doing so for the rest of the society. That's true. Hopper, thank you, Phil. Thank you so much for allowing me to tend to our viewers, Hopper, who are all over the world, to say thank you for watching this conversation. If you enjoyed it, um, remember to subscribe, to like, and to share so that you don't miss out on any of these quality conversations. We have created a website. Uh, we've got a website for you to uh, binge on all our content uh, and also created a podcast for all the conversations that we had. We view, we read all your comments, all your suggestions, all your criticism. Keep them coming. And thank you so much for your support. Until next time, cheers to you all.